Welcome to the Second Bite Podcast, where we talk with top entrepreneurs and CEOs about creating valuable companies through creative transactions. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome back to the Second Bite Podcast. Today with me is Bill Dyer from Boathouse Capital. Bill, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Bill, I'm, I'm excited about our conversation because you guys have been successful as an investor in the lower middle market for a long time. Um, you guys also use debt, and, and debt is a part of a lot of private equity deals, as you know, but we've never really spent time talking about it on the Second Bite podcast. So to have somebody that uses it to effectively get better returns for themselves, for their investors, and for their entrepreneur partners is going to be terrific. So before we jump in, though, I want to just take a second, thank our sponsor, uh, the good people at eCohen. eCohen's a, an accounting firm here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have worked with the folks at eCohen for a long time. They do a great job. They help with due diligence. They help with financial workbooks. They just do a, a whole bunch of stuff. eCohen.com, if you want to check them out. Uh, they're a great friend of the show and a sponsor, so thanks to them. All right, so Bill, if we can, why don't we start with introductions? Tell me a little bit about Boathouse Capital, kind of the areas that you focus on, and maybe we'll just start from there. Uh, sure. So Boathouse Capital, you know, very briefly, uh, we launched the firm in 2009. Uh, it was four of us that, that launched the firm together. Um, we... Uh, we can go into later, I guess we can go into the, the discussion about the debt and equity mix uh, and how we're an SBIC fund. But, you know, briefly on what we do today, we have a $300 million fund. We're uh, investing at a fund three today. Uh, we invest anywhere from $5 million to $30 million off our balance sheet and then into any uh, single deal. We can invest more and bring a partner if need be, but it's not that often that we have to do that. Uh, in terms of the types of deals we do, we invest in companies all across the United States. Uh, we've probably done, uh, we've certainly done more deals in California than we have in, in Pennsylvania, where we're based out of uh, the, the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, and we invest in a lot of software SaaS businesses, a lot of uh, tech-enabled business services. That, that's where we spend most of our time. Uh, but we also have done some healthcare services. We're in a, a, a dental uh roll up. Uh, we got 80 dental clinics, mainly in Texas. Uh, and then we just have some opportunistic deals that uh, come our way that, you know, fit our mandate that, uh, you know, can be in some, you know, arcane industries in some cases. And uh, when you when you partner or invest, are you a control investor all the time? No. Uh, so we'll do about 20 deals out of any given fund. Um, and of those 20 deals in fund three, probably five of them will be control deals and the rest will be non-control deals. And in the non-control deals, we're typically putting investing debt and often some equity as well, though not always. We do a lot of deals too, where it's just debt. Where it's just debt. Mm -hmm. gotcha. right. And, you know, in, in those deals, if we're just doing debt, we, we typically have some equity kicker in, in the form of warrants. So we have we have some ownership of almost all the companies that we invest in. So, and when you talk about your three hundred million dollar fund, that is three hundred million of equity, and then yeah. you, it's a combination of. Correct, correct. So in this fund three, we raised one hundred and twenty five million dollars of equity and one hundred and seventy five million dollars of debt. So it's a one hundred and twenty five million dollar fund, you know, levered with one seventy five of debt. And then can you talk, so a lot of times I'm familiar when somebody does an investment, depending on the company, they will make an investment of equity and then they'll add some debt depending on the factors of the business. Sounds like you've already got the debt prearranged. Can you talk about what, first of all, can you talk about what an SBIC fund is? And then can you talk about how you start off with, with the splits that you have? Sure. So uh, a little background on the SBIC program. So uh, the SBIC program was launched in the 1950s uh, out of the SBA, which is part of the Commerce Department, which is part of the federal government. So this is a federal government program. 
that was launched in the 50s. And the, the rationale behind it, as I understand it, was that the federal government decided that uh, they needed to help capital get into uh, the rural areas and you know, the, the non-urban areas of the United States. And so the way the program was designed, it's designed as a jobs program. The SBA is the Small Business Administration, and, and its mandate or a key piece of its mandate is growing American employment. And so the way the SBIC program works, SBIC stands for Small Business Investment Company. Uh, the way the program works is the SBA will license uh, an investment group. So when 2008 and nine, we applied to the SBA for our license to, to operate an SBIC. We, we were granted that license. And uh, the way the program works is you, you, for every dollar of equity you raise for your fund, the SBA will give you as much as $2 of debt. Um, so in our uh, first two funds, we were levered uh, effectively two to one. Our first fund, we had 40 million of, of equity and, and 80 million of debt from the SBA. And fund two, we had uh, 81 and 150. So that was almost two to one. And then in, in this third fund, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of one and a half to one at 125 and 175. Um, the, the business model from the SBA is break even. You know, they're look they're providing relatively uh, inexpensive debt to the SBIC funds with the goal to bring capital to businesses that otherwise wouldn't, uh, wouldn't get as much capital available to them. Um, and, you know, for our investors, it's a way for them to deploy equity into our fund, and then we deploy their capital levered with the SBA capital, with the SBA debt, and we can amplify the, the returns for our investors. Um, so put simply, uh, you know, we raise a dollar of, of equity, the, the SBA gives us $2 of debt, or $1.50 of debt in our current fund case. Uh, the $2 of debt that, that the SBA provides is, is very attractive debt. It's, it's at a, depending on current rates, you know, you know about 5% is what we've been seeing over the history of our fund. Uh, it's non-amortizing, interest-only, 10-year debt. So it's very uh, easy for us to manage. You know, we, we, uh, we just have to make sure to generate enough interest in our portfolio so that we can uh, pay the SBA their interest. Um, but it gives us a lot of flexibility then in, to invest in companies uh, in a very fluid way. So, you know, we as a firm... Uh, we we look we seek to invest about two thirds of our dollars into debt, and a third goes into equity. Um, we need to invest dollars of debt into companies uh, so that we can generate current income to pay our our uh, our loans back to the SBA. We need to pay make those interest expense payments. Um, but as a firm, what this enables us to do, because we invest debt and equity. We can do deals that are just debt, just equity, or in many cases, a combination of debt and equity. Um, so it gives us a ton of flexibility to structure deals in unique ways that a PE firm cannot do because they're only investing private equity. You know, they invest only equity or uh, a finance institution that is doing debt. They typically only do debt. So because we are really sort of a hybrid firm, we can create hybrid securities that that. Uh, you know, can benefit the folks that we uh, that we're backing the management team. Sure. When does the clock start on the debt for you? When the money goes out the door, or once you've been approved for this hundred and fifty million or seventy five million? The, the the former. You know, when we do a deal, uh, you know, it's not just in time financing as I'm about to describe, but it's pretty close. You know, if we're going to do a thirty million dollar deal. Uh, you know, we'll call equity from our LPs, our limited partners, you know, hey, we need you know, uh, $12 million of, of, uh, of equity from you guys. And then we, we call the debt capital from the SBA, you know, that $18 million, that gives us $30 million to go ahead and invest into, into the uh, company that we're, uh, we're putting capital into. You know, I think it's interesting for first time guys. So you've, quote unquote, raised $125 million of equity. You don't have that sitting in your bank account, right? That you you will access that. Can you 
talk about maybe the different flavors of of private equity equity and for example when you call your guys are they going to say wow you got a good one can you send me the deck i'd like to take a look at it or do they just say yes sir it'll be there in five days yeah so the way the private equity industry works you know as a class if you will um and you know boathouse and the other sbics would fall under that umbrella uh is when we raise a fund we're not getting any cash from our investors rather we're getting commitments so it's no different than i don't know pledges for your church or commitment to a charity or something like that where you're making a promise to uh to provide said capital when uh you get a capital call so if we have 125 million dollar commitments uh in commitments in total from our lps i don't know maybe that's across 50 limited partners, something like that. Uh, some are high net worth individuals, you know, some are fund to funds, you know, a lot of banks are, are LPs in uh, Boathouse and other SBICs. Um, uh, to make the math simple, if we had only three uh, uh, LPs, you know, one is 50 million, another one is 50 million, and another is 25 million, cuming to 125 total, and we're going to uh, do a deal, you know, we're, we're for, you know, we need to call down $10 million from, uh, or $12.5 million to make the math easy from uh, from our LPs, you know, we'll reach out to uh, LP number one, we need 5 million bucks from you tomorrow or in 10 days, uh, number two, five, and then number three, two and a half. And, you know, they have made a promise to us that, that they'll be there with the capital when we call it, and they are. Um, you know, it's quite penal if you don't make your capital call. Uh, so. Uh, LPs have every reason to make those uh, make those wires to wires to us when uh, when it's time, but yeah, they don't have any uh, any right. I mean, we're happy to share with them information about any company that we're about to invest in, but they don't have a right to say no. Uh, the the general partners, the GPs, uh, myself, and a few of my colleagues, we make all decisions as to uh, what investments we're going to make and when we're gonna get liquid on those investments and, and all of those investment related decisions, uh, that's uh, exclusively made by the GP and uh, our LPs, uh, they, they just have to wire us the cash. And sure. Really hope for the best. I mean, that they, they have to do their diligence up front uh, right. on and decide that, hey, these are folks that we wanna, we wanna bet on. And I would imagine their diligence to a large degree begins and ends with fund one and fund two, right? Do you wanna comment on what your track record there has been? Uh, sure. Um, and yes, you know, the raising the first fund is the hardest. Uh, you know, every, every GP would probably tell you that you raise the first fund based on, you know, who, who, you know, uh, friends, family, whatever you can, you can find, you cobble together a fund to get it off the ground. Uh, that was certainly our story. Um, you know, we, we found one very large investor who, who really staked us in the first fund. He was, he was half of the $40 million of equity we raised in the first fund. And, you know, we're for, and for, and for, forever indebted to him. But uh, yeah, our first fund, uh, you know, we still have some investments outstanding. So the fund is not completely liquid yet. But uh, our investors should generate a, about a six times return on their money in, in the first fund. Um, net of all fees and expenses. So if they put in a dollar, they should get six bucks back, something like that. Uh, our second fund that we still have several, uh, you know, quite a few companies still outstanding, but the way it's trending, uh, you know, it should be about a four times return for our investors. And we would hope to, uh, duplicate those kinds of returns in, in, in fund three and beyond. Gotcha. And, and yes, the investors that were with us in fund one have remained with us in fund two and three. Um, we've picked up new friends along the way, but, uh, definitely track record is matters a lot. So help me understand then, you know, because a lot of the folks listening, I think, you know, do not use debt, perhaps avoid debt because it's, it, you know, they don't either don't understand that there's a tool or, or don't have the use for what have you. So to use an example, let's say my company is worth $30 million. You and I went through a whole bunch of stuff and we agree it's worth 30 million bucks and you're going to give me 10 million. Can you explain, for example, and maybe you can compare it to, to a private equity group that would say, hey, here's 10 million bucks. 
and and how you can use your debt to provide better return for your private equity partner and for your for your investors. Sure. So um, in the world in which uh, you know you your business is worth thirty million dollars and and uh, you're going to take out ten million, you know the math is pretty easy. You know private equity firm comes in says, hey, Todd, we agree your, your company's worth 30 million bucks. Uh, we're going to put $10 million into your business, which you're going to take home with you. Uh, so we're going to buy 10 divided by 30 uh, or one third of your business. So upon that transaction taking place, uh, we'll own one third and you'll own two thirds. Um, the math gets a little more complicated if the money stays in the business uh, for growth, you know, but uh, uh, you know, for simplicity, let's just go with that. So, you know, the PE fund buys a 30-year company and you walk home with 10 million bucks. Probably you continue to run the company, et cetera. You know, if we do that same deal with debt, uh, you know, the math is, is, is quite different and, you know, less dilutive to you. Uh, this is where we put in $10 million of debt. Now the company has a $10 million debt obligation to Boathouse. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, let's put an interest rate on it of 10% to make the math easy. Is there a personal guarantee on that 10? No, we very rarely take personal guarantees. Okay. Um, you know, banks usually do, you know, we, we do not. Um, so in that case, we put in $10 million of debt. You take that $10 million out as, as a dividend or, or whatever. Um, and, uh, you continue to own, you know, hundred percent of the business, let's say, but now you've got a, a, uh, a debt obligation. You've got to pay us back. Typically, our, our debt is going to be non-amortizing, you know, five-year papers. So you, you know, and let's put a 10% cash interest rate on it to make math easy. So you're going to, you know, pay us a million dollars a year for five years. Uh, and at the end of that five-year period, you got to pay us back the 10 million bucks uh, and you're done. Um, you know, typically in, in our deals, uh, we're going to take some warrants. And so in the, in the first world, uh, you uh, brought in the private equity fund and you gave up a third of your business. Uh, in this world, you know, maybe you give up 5% or maybe 10%, but a heck of a lot less than one third. And so in a world in which your business does really, really well and can, continues to grow, um, you know, you're way better off. Uh, you know, your business is worth $30 million today. And let's say in five years, your business is worth $100 million and we've taken a, a 10% warrant. You know, uh, you know, you got to pay us the 10 million bucks back. And, you know, we're our 10% of the business is worth, you know, say $10 million. So we, you know, we get out 20. Um, but you own 90% of the business. So you, your take home is much greater than if you had brought in the equity shop and you gave up a third of your business. Um, and, and so when you, Talk about returns of four and five times like you did in your first couple funds. Mm -hmm. Is that be, is that because you're good at pricing risk on the debt and making equity investments, or do you do you help the CEO grow a better, more valuable business? So both. Um, you know, we we're very very different. You know, we're much more similar to a private equity shop than a debt shop in the way that we're structured and in in what we actually do. Um, and you know why is that? Well, you know it's because we off we we staff as accordingly to you know as, as if we're a pea shop, and also because we are a pea shop in many deals. You know about a quarter of our deals we actually do take a control position, and so by that all I, I mean that you know if we're going to be in the buyout business, we have to have an ability to add value to our portfolio. Otherwise, we're not going to be very good buyout investors. But we bring that same. Uh, capability to all of our portfolio, whether we we own uh, five percent of the company or one hundred percent of the company or any number in the in in between or zero percent. You know, we've had done a few deals where we actually don't own any, and you know, we we provide the same services. So, uh, you know, we have operating partners that help with sales and marketing go to market. Uh, we have operating partners who are former CEOs who can provide, uh, you know, counsel to our CEOs, our founder CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and where we can be fairly helpful is, is in a, uh, a capacity as an outsourced uh, corporate development department, you know, working with the portfolio to figure out, okay, what's the strategy? How are we going to grow this business? What's, what are the value drivers? You know, if, if the value drivers include M&A, 
then you know we can be particularly helpful in you know we have a full-time person whose role it is to work with a portfolio and find add-ons that fit with the parameters of what the portfolio is looking for the company's looking for we find it we bring it in we um you know uh, uh help the the companies to negotiate uh deals uh we help them to bring in financing if bank debt's needed um we certainly help to close those deals so we're we're very good at m a and that's something that is a big value driver for a lot of our portfolio companies will you add on more investment if required for the tuck-in hopefully yes you know uh, i mean our goal you know is to deploy as much capital as we can into our portfolio um, you know, with limits, you know, we can't go over, you know, 10% of our fund in any one deal. So 30 million is our, our cap in any one deal. But, you know, we'd love to invest $25 million per portfolio company. Often we'll start at five or 10 or 12 or 15. But, you know, if we can deploy more then you know, hooray for us, that, uh, that that's our ultimate goal. Uh, so, yes, we do a lot of following. Cool. And so do you notice any similarities? in the portfolio companies you've worked with now over your last few funds, the things that very consistently provide outsized return and in, in, in areas that you can help folks focus on to get that return. I say folks, I mean, entrepreneurs. Is sure. it consistent over and over again? Um, so if there's one, one thing that is is really the driver, the most common driver of of outsized returns, it's it's management. Um, you know, I've seen many companies that uh, are in tough industries uh, run by really strong uh, leaders who do really well, and I've seen the opposite, where you know this should be a layup. It's a great industry, great business, but just wrong leadership. And so, you know, I'd say that you know working with our entrepreneurs to uh, help them to bolster their management teams and, and, and in fact, bolster themselves. A lot of the entrepreneurs, uh, you know, they, they have gaps, you know, they, they're, they're founders, you know, of businesses and many of them have never, you know, sometimes have never worked in any other company in their life. And so, you know, they don't have a uh, big company experience where they would have learned, uh, processes, uh, and procedures that help them to scale a company to a larger size. Uh, so I'd say that, um, you know, working with our CEOs to build their management teams and, and their personal skill set is is a is a key deliver is a key way to deliver value. Um, you know, the other I'd say is you know just being laser focused on the value drivers to business, whether it's M and A or organic growth or whatever it might be, and then executing upon it. Um, you know, I'd say what we most commonly see is is really M and A is a big driver of value, be it a, a roll up or or some other tuck in that brings some strategic value to the business where you get one plus one equals two or, or three or seven, you know, so um, that that's the most common way we see our businesses really uh, drive value. That's great. So let's go back now to the 10 million bucks in, 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 in that we were talking about. So 10 million, the company grows from 30 to a hundred. I sell it for a hundred. I've got to pay you the 10, the 10 million back. And then the 10 million of interest. And I think you said the interest is probably less than that, or is it 10% about the right factor? Yeah, 10% is probably a fair number. It could be less, you know, so it's five years at, you know, 10%. So, you know, 5 million bucks of interest along the way. So I paid out 15, I keep 85 plus the 10 I took up front. So I got 95 as opposed to 70, right? So $25 million difference, a pretty big difference. So I get that. And there's no personal guarantee on the debt. It does. Go, it is going to use some of my cash flow because we got to satisfy that on a regular basis. Then And so that works. That's great because I went from 30 to 100. And anytime you go from 30 to 100, most things work out well. What's the argument for doing like a five and five or a seven and three or a three and seven or something like that? Why? And how do you make those decisions if if you have to use, if you have to deploy both capital and debt. Right. That's a good question. Um, So, uh, you know, the argument for using a blended amount, I I would say that entrepreneurs generally like the debt product um, that we have. And, and the reason is because it is very flexible. You know, we, we do have covenants on our debt. Uh, You know, they're, they're few few, you know, few financial covenants and they're generally, you know, quite makeable. So, uh, 
you know, we're not looking to make money on fees and, and penalties and that sort of stuff. We're, we're making money on growing businesses. So we're very, very different from a, a bank or, you know, a straight lender. Um, so I would say that generally entrepreneurs, when they kind of understand our debt product, say, yeah, I want that. Like, give, give me that, you know, give me, you know, I, I'll keep as much equity as I can. I, I have a, uh, you know, I'm optimistic about my business, so I'd like to own more than less. Um, you know, the constraints on that are, are typically cash flow. You know, we're, we're not going to, uh, you know, go too deep in the capital structure with debt. So if, uh, you know, if EBITDA of the business is $5 million, we're not going to put $50 million of debt on it, for example. It's, um, you know, it's just that the company would be too laden with debt for, you know, compared to its cash flow. Um, so, you know, typically the way the conversation goes is, you know, we talk about our various products, debt equity, and, and then, you know, debt equity products are sort of a hybrid uh, product. But, you know, if it's a, uh, a debt discussion, you know, we, we typically say, look, you know, we're willing to put in X amount of dollars of debt. You know, let's say in that $5 million EBITDA business, we, we're willing to put in $15 million of debt. Um, but the company needs, you know, 20, two, $25 million of capital. So well, fine, we'll put in $15 million of debt and we'll provide another $10 million of capital for the, uh, in the form of equity. So it's a debt equity mix investment where it's 15 of debt and 10 of equity and the entrepreneur benefits from getting all the capital he or she needs. Um, uh, and, you know, it, the, the capital structure we put together is, uh, is in line with the company's cash flow. So the company's not overly laden with, with debt. Um, but, you know, the entrepreneur is m minimizing the dilution that he or she is taking in, in, that, in that investment. And can you share a, um, an intro explanation of what warrants are and what that means? Sure. So, uh, you know, commonly when we're making these debt investments, uh, we're getting warrants. Um, and, you know, warrants are exactly like a stock option. You know, folks are probably uh, familiar with that when you buy a stock option, you know, on the, you know, the public markets, uh, you know, you're, you're, you, you're getting the option to buy a stock at a specific price. Um, you know, the way to think about it with our debt investment typically are the warrants that we're getting as part of a debt investment. Uh, the strike price on those warrants are, is typically, you know, nominal. So, you know, basically zero. So if we put in uh, that $15 million of debt I just spoke about and we get a 5% warrant, then we're, we're really getting 5% ownership of the business. So, uh, and that's typically a 10-year warrant um, that uh, is exercisable, you know, during that 10-year period. You know, we typically can't exercise it until, you know, uh, uh, we don't, we typically don't exercise until we get liquid. So when either the company pays us back or the company is sold, then we, you know, we, that 5% ownership of the business, we get that, you know, that paid back. Um, so I think the, the simple way to think about it is with our debt investment, we're getting a, a percentage ownership of the company. Um, uh, that is a war that is called a warrant, but it's basically an equity ownership. Got it. And then when we do that, whether it's a blend or whether it's all debt, the entrepreneur still has access to the team, the resources, the the um, corporate development, all the rest. That's correct. That's correct. We, um, you know, we take a board seat in basically every company that we're invested into. Um, I think there's one or two we might have board observation rights, but uh, you know, the full range of services that we provide to our portfolio companies are available to every one of the portfolio companies and what each company takes advantage of is, is really kind of up to them, honestly, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if we're the control investor, then I guess it's up to us, but if we're not in the uh, control position, um, you know, to the extent that the company wants our help, you know, more than less, like we're delighted to give it, you know, but yeah. I, I'd say typically we're in touch with our CEOs weekly all the time, you know, yeah. talking about whatever initiatives there may be go going on. And, and they would see that as a positive, not you being up in their business. Fair? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd say that's, you know, yes across the board because, um, you know, that's really a big part of our pitch to the companies that we invest in. That along with the capital we're providing to you, we are here to provide our assistance to you. And, you know, if, 
that's not something you want, that, that that's fine. You don't have to take advantage of our services, but you know, people tend to go with us because they want that help rather than sure. Not want that help. And how do you guys establish a minimum? Is it a check size that you write or an amount of debt or or how do you think about that? Yeah, we um so in our first fund, we were writing small checks, you know, uh three to ten million bucks. Um in this fund, you know, we can write up to thirty million dollars. So, you know, we've kind of kept uh, in fund two, we had a $5 million minimum investment per deal. Uh, we've kept to that five. Um, but, you know, I'd say that when we're, when we're writing $5 million checks, it's, it's with the hope and belief that we can layer in more capital, sure. you know, so it, it'd be hard to run a $300 million fund, putting out $5 million chunk, dollar chunks in every company. We'd have a massive portfolio. Right. And then last couple questions would be, you know, is, so we're in the summer of 22. Inflation's doing this, and you know the world's at unrest in, in in Ukraine and the rest. People are nervous about liquidity in the markets and blah blah blah. How, how does a a professional investor like you th- think about that? Do you worry about that? Do you kind of look past it? Is it just another cycle? W- what would you offer there? So uh, I would say it's just another cycle. Um, you know, we're in the business of deploying capital. Our, our LPs, you know, give us the equity capital that we use uh, to, that we lever and, and put out uh, investments into our portfolio companies. You know, they, they don't ask us to sit on the sidelines. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, we don't have the luxury, honestly. We have, we have a five-year period to deploy this $300 million, and that's our responsibility and our job to do that. So. Um, it is true that as as the market cycles, leverage levels, return expectations by investors may change. Um, so certainly portfolio companies or potential portfolio companies are going to get valued differently in different markets and different cycles. But um, no, we, we have a very patient uh, investor with the SBA. You know, we don't have to worry about the SBA recalling calling our debt back, you know, in any cycle. Uh, so we have no, you know, run on the bank risk, if you will, at the fund level. Um, and, you know, we have a mandate by our LPs to deploy their capital. Um, you know, so, you know, uh, no, we, you know, yes, inflation is 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 rampant right now. And, uh, you know, we just have to factor that into our investment decisions. But, uh, you know, we invested very aggressively last year and we hope to do so again this year. When- when you look across your the sectors, right, SaaS, tech enabled, some of the other medical services, is there anything that you're a sector that you're most excited about or more excited about than the others currently? You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, SaaS is always uh, good, uh, at least from a debt perspective, perspective, because it's just very repeatable. You know, the it's got the holy grail of business you know, which is recurring revenue, you know, contractually recurring. But we're actually looking right now at a few, you know, somewhat cyclical companies and building products uh, in other industrial areas where, um, uh, you know, we, we feel like if we make those investments conservatively now, you know, with conservative debt levels that, you know, when we come out of this cycle, we'll find ourselves, you know, in, in, a, in a, you know, pretty happy position. Um, you know, I'd say the SaaS, uh, uh, industry has been highly picked over. You know, we were pretty early to invest in SaaS. Our first SaaS deal was in maybe 2012. Um, and, uh, you know, that deal was quite novel and uh, extremely successful. Um, you know, I'd say that, uh, you know, people caught on to that. And yeah. so, um, you know, we're, we're not alone now in, in, in liking that sector. Um, so I'd say we're, uh, you know, we're getting a bit more creative and looking at other things as well. Gotcha. And then my last question is I, I typically and, you know, I, I know that you have been particularly successful in your business life and in your family life and in the community there in Philadelphia. Is there something that you would point to um, either a book or an experience or a mentor that you could attribute a lot of your success to? Hmm. Let me think about that one. Um... I mean, I guess I would say it's the approach. Um, you know, when I started in this industry uh, back in wow, twenty yeah, two thousand and two is when I January 02 is when we started in the, in the business. Uh, 
you know, it was a small office here in Philadelphia of, a, of, of another firm, much bigger firm. And, you know, our approach in that office and the approach we've taken at, at Boathouse is just that of pretty brutal transparency, uh, transparency and high integrity. And so, you know, that is what we bring to our uh, portfolio companies. That is what we bring to the founders that we back. And, um, uh, you know, as a result of that, you know, we're highly trusted by the folks that we back. Um, you know, we, that's not to say that every deal has gone perfectly well, because it definitely is not the case. Um, you know, we've done 50 platform investments now, uh, out of, out of our firm, uh, here at Boathouse, you know, 19 in the first fund, 21 in the second fund, I think, and then, you know, maybe 10 already in fund three. So yeah, we've had, a, you know, a few misses, not, not any big ones, fortunately, but, um, uh, you know, we are extremely referenceable within our portfolio, all of our CEOs, uh, uh, we speak to them all the time. We're in touch with them all the time. And, and, you know, when potential CEOs, you know, potential investments, uh, those founders want to reference us, it's very easy to do. You know, we can connect, you can just go on our website and see where we've invested and talk to those folks. But, you know, I'd say that really honesty and integrity is, is kind of what we focus on. Um, yeah. you know, uh, we're not looking to be the low price guy in the market. Uh, you know, we're trying to be as helpful as we possibly can to our portfolio and as honest we, as we can. And, and that has served us you know, quite well. And that's, uh, that is great insight. The whole episode was great insight, Bill. So thank you for that. Uh, on it, at secondbytepodcast.com, there's show notes and a way to reach Boathouse Capital. But for if somebody want to reach you, Bill, it's Bill Dyer D Y E R at BoathouseCapital.com, correct? That is correct. Excellent. And folks know how to get me, what you can find on the show notes. Uh, Bill, great to have you as a guest. The insight was was wonderful. So that's appreciated. Wish you continued success with Fund Three. And perhaps we'll have you on again in the not too distant future. We can do a case study on a successful full round trip. That would be great. Really appreciate you having me and uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for listening to the Second Bite Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.